Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm a school teacher or was a school teacher, so I expect interaction and response. Amen. Wasn't that a brilliant flow of thought from the Lord through Pastor Salvin? And so I, we don't want to keep you long at all, and I want to be conscious of time. Um, so I just want to move straight into the same flow of thought, I think, um, that Pastor Salvin moved into. And just in a seamless fashion, just re-echo some of the same sentiments from different vantage points. Um, it's very, very important that when you consider a topic of this nature, which is strong support for one's spiritual father, that you understand what you are supporting. You're not supporting an individual. You're supporting the purposes of God managed or stewarded by the individual. God gives his purposes into the custody of men to administrate. And when you're called upon to support, for example, the purposes of God vested in the spiritual father, it's important you have sight like Issachar had. What you see will determine how strong your support is. If you simply see this as a human being, a man, that has some form of oversight or covering over me spiritually, and I'm called upon to hold up his or her hands to provide strength and support to them in one respect or another, let's say to support a specific project, conference, for example, and you don't see the broader purpose behind the project, you will fail in supporting the project because you fail to perceive the greater divine purpose behind what the project seeks to administrate. And so I want to encourage us all to see beyond what is apparent. Now, in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, maybe we should start there. And I promise you we won't be long this evening because I think just listening to Pastor Salvin, I think the Spirit of the Lord has spoken expressly. And we want to be sensitive to the moods and the nuances of the Spirit um, in reference to what God wants specifically for this purpose, for this gathering. What is His purpose behind bringing this collective of people here to listen to this specific topic this evening. And so, you know that Malachi closes, Malachi 4 verse 5, Behold, I'm going to send you the prophet Elijah before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Verse 6, He will restore the hearts of fathers to their children or sons, and the hearts of children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land or the earth with a, with a curse. Everyone say curse. So the Hebrew word here is herem, H-E-R-E-M. So the word herem is vastly different from other Hebrew words also translated in English as curse. The way it's used in Malachi means the following. It's used to describe a noose, like a rope that, for example, cowboys would use to capture an animal and to drag the animal away from the centrality of some scenario. That's the image in the Hebrew of the word. So you reduce mobility of the animal, you cut its activity short, and the idea of dragging it away to a place of immobility or insignificance. So the idea of herem in the, in the Hebrew, and let me just um, tell it to you almost literally what the word means. The word herem means to be reduced to a place of such insignificance that the memory of you is wiped off forever from the face of the earth. Now that's very dangerous, right? I'll repeat that again. It means to be reduced or subjugated to a place of such insignificance that the memory of you is wiped off from the face of the earth forever. It is also used of one 
who played no significant role in contributing to the unfolding nature of divine purpose. Right? Now, I don't know about you, but I want to play a contributing role to divine purpose. At the end of my life, I don't want it said, here lies Randolph Barnwell. He contributed nothing to divine purpose. Right? I don't want my life to be reduced to a place of such insignificance that in heaven's registry, there's no record of me facilitating divine purpose in the earth. Now that is cursed. So not to live in a realm called cursed is to abide in the father-son dyad or dynamic, the father-son relationship. Because the very nature of things father-son is that vehicle or that medium that then facilitates divine purpose, right? So in asking a son to facilitate the purpose or support the purposes in a, in a father, that son must see something far bigger than the father as a person. You must understand that divine purposes are given to fathers to administrate. And as Salvin rightly said, you're going to have to die unto yourself. You're going to have to have your own personal kenosis, your own personal self-emptying. Become a man of no ambition, no reputation. When I um, formalized my relationship with Pastor Thamo in, in reference to spiritual fathering, we were doing the mats just yesterday. It's about 18 years now we're walking together. And my, my whole life changed completely. But it demanded that I die unto myself and to serve a higher purpose that he's administrating and to do everything in my power in both spiritual, natural, and even financial expressions, support a purpose that he's managing. I have become the beneficiary of grace. Right? And you've got to see, your eyes have got to be open to the fact that as you support the purposes vested in your spiritual father that you become strengthened in the process but let me let me tell you it will cost you and it will require everything concerning you um, as many of you know my favorite way to teach the father son principle is to use the book of ruth and don't worry we won't be here all night okay but the book only has four chapters in any case. But we took almost a year, one full year at church to teach one book in terms of father-son principles, but using the book, the book of Ruth as a template. In Ruth 4.15, Ruth is clearly identified as a son, right? Ruth chapter 4 verse 15, a prophecy went out that Ruth will be better than seven sons to Naomi, that would automatically cast Naomi, not in the role of mother-in-law, but in the role of father. If she's a son in the narrative, then Naomi is, the, is the, the father. And she comes to a place of perfection in her sonship. She's not just seven sons, she's better than. She is far better than seven. But you know the story. You know the story. How she supported Naomi. Not so. In her gleanings in the field, daily she constantly brought produce back to her spiritual father, her mother-in-law, and ensured that she's well taken care of, her welfare is, is, is kept. You know why? Because Ruth means something worth seeing. That's what the word Ruth means. Say to my wife, if we have another daughter, she will be Ruth. Okay? She will have nothing to do with that arrangement. Okay? Um, but Ruth means something worth beholding. Ruth is a picture of the church, which is a picture of perfected sonship. Better than seven, seven denoting perfection or rest. A son, like Issachar, with Pastor Salvin said, has come into a rested position to support burdens, like a donkey. Right? Ruth comes into her own rest by virtue of her capacity to see. Her name doesn't simply mean something worth beholding. 
The etymology of Ruth in the Hebrew means from such. So she's able, she's something worth beholding because she can see. So when she sees Naomi, she sees someone that is carrying divine purpose. Someone administrating an administration of heaven that is far bigger than her. In fact, if she supports and, 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 and takes care, sustains the purposes of God vested in Naomi, she will come to find her Boaz. Every single one of Naomi's instructions to her throughout the book was critical to bring her to a place of marrying Boaz. Not so? And who is Boaz representative of in the narrative? Christ. A spiritual father always leads, guides, instructs a spiritual son to become intimate with Christ. Right? It's not the relationship between Ruth and Naomi that produced Boaz. It was the marriage between Ruth and Boaz. Sorry, uh, Obed. I beg your pardon. It's not the relationship between Ruth and Naomi that produced Obed, the son. It was the relationship between Ruth and Boaz that produced Obed. But Naomi's role was critical to get the son to a place of intimacy with Boaz. Right? So spiritual fathers always lead spiritual sons to a place of intimacy with Christ to produce something in the earth that will affect the earth for generations to come. Right? So you must see every instruction, for example, as a sp of a spiritual father, not to enslave you, not to restrict you, not to circumvent, not to hamstrung you. Um, and we don't have time to go through the detailed instructions given in the four chapters of Ruth. Our father will instruct a son where the son must die unto herself in this context to fulfill divine mandate. Obed, the son born to Ruth and Boaz, is eventually born. And you know the story. When Obed was born, um, Ruth took the boy. And what did Ruth do to the boy? Placed the boy on whose lap? On Naomi's lap. Right? She became his nurse. And they said, a son has been born this day to Naomi, not to Ruth. So what the son generated deferred to the father. Because the father has custody or, or, or apostolic administration as to how to guide what the son produces. What the son produces must always be in reference to the purposes of God administrated by the Father. Otherwise, you're going to lose the plot. <laughs> Otherwise, you will, you will think this is slavery. <laughs> this is burdensome, right? This is not burdensome. Let me just quickly share with you, and then because, I know because of time, I want to quickly share with you just one thought. And I, I think the last time I was here, I shared these thoughts. Uh, I've kept all of my thoughts in this document. Um, but I want us to share the principle of how this will benefit you. Right? This will benefit you. This is not enslavement. This is designed publicly to enrich you, to grow you, to bless you. In First Chronicles chapter 11 and verse 10, now these were the heads of the mighty men whom David had, who gave him, everyone say strong support. First Chronicles 11 and verse 10. Who gave him strong support. First Chronicles, sorry. First Chronicles 11, 10. These are the heads of the mighty men whom David had, who gave him strong support in his kingdom, together with all Israel, to make him king, according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Everyone say they gave him strong support. Now, the same verse in the, in the King James Version of the Bible, 1 Chronicles 11.10, these are also the chief of the mighty men whom David had, who strengthened themselves with him. Everyone say they strengthened themselves with him. 
right? And that's the King James. The NASB yes, says they gave him strong support in his kingdom. So in them giving him strong support, what are they doing to themselves? So when you strengthen your leader, you're literally strengthening yourself, right? This is not uh, a kind of only upward direction kind of responsibility where we give upward, we uphold, where the Aaron's and her on, the, on each side of Moses holding his hands up. What we do to spiritual fathers directly, positively impacts and strengthens and supports us, okay? But like I said, you're going to have to empty yourself of your ambition, of your insecurity, right? Of the need to establish a name for yourself. When I learn to die to these things, you know, we can speak confidently about these things because we've literally had to walk the, the road. We literally had to walk through some painful uh, dying to self in order to fulfill mandates that others carry, that fathers carry, right? And there's one purpose that they have. It's to form the nature and the image of Christ in sons. That's the overarching grand narrative purpose that spiritual fathers have. It's to mature the sons in the way of Christ, and I don't know why that the Lord's maybe stressing these things. You know, there's always time to get into practical things. How do you practically support? But if you don't understand the philosophy of what we are saying, you will fail in those practical expressions. I hope you haven't come here this evening hoping to find out step one, what must we do? <laughs> right? In fact, if you understand this, you will know what to do. Right? There's nothing you will not do to support when you understand the spiritual significance of, of it. Now, and we're going to get into a discussion just now because I know time is running. Just quickly go to Psalm 77 and verse 15. In fact, I want to move away from this manual because I, I don't think we're going to get too much done here. <laughs> Lest you are prepared to stay all night, which I don't think we are. But just quickly go to Psalm 77, I think it is, and verse 15. Psalm 77 and verse 15. Uh, you have by your power redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. In other words, Selah means camp here, ruminate, don't carry on reading. Think about this a while. Ruminate over days and days over this thought. And we were having a, a prayer meeting at church. We pray every Saturday morning. And in this one particular prayer meeting, we were speaking about Jacob and Joseph. And at the end of the meeting, my son, who lives in Cape Town, he actually preached at church this morning. He's on holiday in Durban right now. You can see I, I made great sacrifices to be here. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, he texted me this verse directly after the meeting. Um, because of certain uh, things that we prayed over in the prayer meeting. And this verse specifically speaks about the sons of Jacob and, and Joseph. Now, you know that Jacob or Joseph is Jacob's son, not so? But the text elevates Joseph to stand alongside his father. And the writer of the scriptures, the Holy Spirit, accords all the sons of Jacob, including Joseph. But Joseph now has is, is been accorded fatherly status even to his brothers, the other sons of Jacob. Right? So there's this elevation of, of Joseph. But what did it cost Joseph to have this kind of accord given to him? You know the story. His brothers hated him. He finds himself in Egypt, long story short, raised second to the Pharaoh, remember? While in Egypt, he marries and he begets two sons, the firstborn being Manasseh and the second Ephraim. He named Manasseh Manasseh specifically because he said in his own words, because God has made me to forget 
the trouble of my brothers and my father's house. Right? The first part of the meaning of Manasseh is good. God has made me to forget the troubles and the pain of my brothers. But he added, and my father's house. So in Joseph's mind, he said, I'm cutting off brothers, and I'm cutting off father's house. Now the moment you say that I cut off father's house, you're living in a realm called cursed. You can be successful, but it will never be written in the registry of heaven that you played any significant role in contributing to divine purpose. So Joseph is at a critical place, and I just sense prophetically there are many of us here this evening or at a critical juncture or of either now from this meeting going on and you're going to live in a place called Herem, you will still do stuff. You will still, you're still second in charge of the Pharaoh, still have prominence, still do things, but it will never be recorded that you were instrumental to facilitate some key aspects of divine purpose. So, you know the story how it goes. A second boy comes, and his name is Ephraim, which means doubly fruitful, right? Doubly fruitful. And many times, because Joseph was so successful, your double fruitfulness can cause you to have amnesia and cause you to forget the pain of brothers and the responsibility of supporting the vision of your father, whom you have chosen to forget. Right? Now, why do I say Joseph chose to forget father? How old was he when he was sold? 17, not so. How old was he when he came into rulership? 30. How many years have passed? Come on, do the math. 13. Come on, work with me. 13 years have passed, not so. Then you have, give a year or two. Then you have the seven years of plenty. Remember the dream? So, so 13 plus 7 is 20. 20 years have gone by. The seven lean years start, and the scripture says in the second year of the seven lean years, that's when the brothers came down. So 22 years have passed since you last seen brothers. Now, I would think it should have been his, one of the first executive decisions of Joseph when he came into strong rulership, second to the Pharaoh, should have been, let's go, let me go see, at least see daddy. Where's papa? Where's the father in grace? Right? Do you know that once he reconciled with brothers, okay, I'm just cutting a long story short here because of time, once he reconciled with brothers, then his first decision was, bring my father down here and do it quickly. Remember he said, do it quickly. Because he realized, and he said, bring the father down so he can see my glory which I have in Egypt. When Jacob came down to Egypt, you know the story. He was introduced to Pharaoh and the Bible says he blessed Pharaoh, not so? He imparted something to, to Pharaoh. You see, Joseph only then realized, I have made a big blunder here. I've chosen to factor father out of my world. Right? I should have called for him at 30. Seven years plus two. He's probably around 39 or 40 plus years old now. And God had to order. He even forgot brothers and the pain of brothers. I want to encourage someone. I'm just picking this up prophetically. Never allow the pain of brothers to cause you to forget your father's house. Never allow the pain or the hurt and betrayal of something brotherly to cause you to disconnect from the fatherly principle. Right? You cannot support a fatherly or any father with the pain of brother in your heart. That's why what Pastor Salvin said is so important. Um, and I deal with this extensively in this, in this writing. One of the primary expressions of your support to your spiritual father would be to love his other sons. <laughs> Amasai, one of the 30, said to King David, we are yours. Remember? 
the 30 mighty men of David that gave him strong support. We just read about it. As they strengthened David, they strengthened themselves. A Messiah was chief of the 30. When he came to David, he said this, We are yours. In other words, we die to ourselves. Like Issachar, we are voluntary slaves. In a good sense. We are yours, O son of Jesse. And he said, Peace to you. Peace, peace to you. Double shalom to you, but peace to everybody else here that is with you. So a Messiah ensured the peace of David by seeking the peace of his brothers. The way you build a strong house is by seeking the peace of your brothers. I love Pastor Thama with all of my heart. He knows that. Nothing I would not do for him. But if I cannot love Salvin, his other son, many people say to praise above with the saints we love, Oh, that will be glory. But to praise below with the saints we know, that's another story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can never ever love God beyond the measure that you love His other sons. In a strong house, you want to you make, in, in terms of this particular ministry, thy will ministries, you want to uphold Pastor Vishnu and Lisa's hands and give strong support. One of the primary ways, like was said, let the affection of the love of Christ be filtered through you to them. And so Joseph had to overcome and pass the forgiveness test. And that he did. You know that. So let me, let me close. At the end of his journey, so to speak, Jacob comes down. And you know the classic Genesis 49 is where Jacob prophesies of all the boys. But in Genesis 48, he first prophesied over Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. Remember Joseph brought the two boys to him? And Joseph positioned Manasseh at his right hand, Ephraim at his left. You know, remember Jacob now is half, well, he's totally blind. So his natural sight is dim, but his spiritual sight is sharp and wittingly, King James language, knowingly, discerningly, he crossed his hands, he put his right hand, the right hand, the executive um, hand that represents governmental authority, the right hand of the Lord does valiantly on the head of, of Ephraim. So firstborn status, firstborn responsibility goes to Ephraim. Manasseh could never occupy firstborn in rank, even though he's firstborn in time. He's firstborn in time, but not firstborn in rank, because he was so named the one who forgets father's house. He who forgets father's house can never steward divine purpose. Right? And there's a whole lesson in that altogether. The, another big test, you know, Joseph protested when he saw this happening, but his father said, no, suffer it to be so now. Know exactly what I'm doing here. You know, Jacob had discernment. Further to this, when the boys came to Jacob, Jacob said to Joseph, These are not your sons. <laughs> now, Joseph could have said, But yo, where were you <laughs> when I was raising them? You were in another distant, geographically far removed land. He willingly gave up the boys. Manasseh and Ephraim became sons of Jacob. Yeah? There is no tribe called the tribe of Joseph. There are two tribes called the tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim. Right? Technically, there are 13 tribes. Yet Joseph's name means... A son who adds, or God has added a son. Many people often hear it said that Joseph means addition, or Joseph means add. No, it does not. You read the scriptures carefully. Joseph is so named because it says, for God has added a son. Everyone say he's added a son. The addition is sonship. And Joseph 
comes into so-called double portion as firstborn in his father's house. You know, Reuben forfeited the firstborn, right? Right? Firstborn of, what is the first God's name? Leah. Firstborn of Rachel's sons, Joseph, takes his place. Coat of many colors. Right? He comes to his father as firstborn in the family. One on whom has the responsibility of purpose. Not so? He brings his two sons, and the one he thinks will occupy firstborn status, Manasseh forfeits that because Manasseh's whole character, nature, and disposition represents one that forgets brotherly pain and father's house. When you forget father's house, you forget the purpose of God vested in the house. That's why Manasseh could never occupy firstborn status in the family. But Joseph willingly gave up the boys into the fatherly custody and claim of Jacob over them. Yeah? So now let's take the other brothers like Reuben and all the other guys. Now when they see Manasseh and Ephraim, they cannot refer to them as my nephews. They have to say these are our brothers that stand shoulder to shoulder with us because they represent Joseph, our brother. Right? So what you give up, Joseph, what you give up, Joseph, God will elevate. What you are willing to relinquish, God will take it and graft it into divine purpose to bring about a particular result in the earth. I speak from experience. I'm not just speaking from theology here. I've, I've walked this walk. I know exactly what I'm saying. And I want to encourage everyone in here that feels that I must, in a sense, give up stuff, give up whatever the Holy Spirit brings to your mind in, so that I can fully support a father and it will be accorded to him and not me. What I produce is his and not mine. What you're willing to let go, God will take it. God will elevate it. Yeah. But that also elevated Joseph. Because Joseph now is not another son of Jacob. Joseph now stands co-equal with his father to lead the family. Yeah. There are many texts in Scripture that prove this point from various angles, but we, we won't go there. All I want you to know is, outside of just going through practical ways of how can you support, if you don't understand the philosophy behind this, the truth behind this, right? if you don't see, if your sight is not exposed to this, your obedience to practical principles will wane. Recently, um, Pastor Thamo's church in Gate Santon just bought their building. What's it, 24? 20, 24 million rand. And I was at the church on the Easter weekend, and the God just spontaneously spoke to my heart to sow 500,000. I don't know how many dollars that is. 500,000 rand. What, 20? I can't even work the maths out now. In any case, everyone say a lot of money. <laughs> And the Lord said to me, and you will give the first 10% of that, which is 50,000 rand. So I made this public as I'm finishing my sermon. I go to my seat. I walk out the church. We dismissed. As we walk out the church, my phone rings, a, 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 a notification. Someone just deposited 50,000 rand into my account, my bank account. When my wife was with me. We looked at each other. and we, She said to me, you know we can't touch this money. It's good to have your wife on the same page. <laughs> and immediately we released it. EFT'd it to the gate property account. Came to my church and I told them, we as a local church, corporately we are a son to a patriarchal spiritual father. We emptied all our accounts, the investment account, the, all the money we had in the bank account, and we started sowing towards this 500,000 rand that we pledged. And I just made the appeal. If you want to be part of this, I taught a specific just two sessions on principles surrounding this, and it was in four weeks we had the money. 
No, we're not a big group. Uh, Dave and Maurice have been to our context. Joseph, you've been there. We're not a massive church, you know. <laughs> a small group, relatively small by most standards. But why did God give resource? Resource is given because of our hearts to support. Not so? If our hearts are not inclined to support vision vested in our Father, we're not willing to empty bank accounts and give up and make personal sacrifices. Why? Because we see, I see prophetically what's going to happen in that building in the next few years. And I want in. Tell someone, I want in. <laughs> right? You might think you're losing now, but you are setting up processes for your elevation. It's not the elevation you seek. Don't, don't get me wrong. God is no man's debtor. He will reward you. Right? All we want to do is simply be obedient to, to the Lord. Right? Paul said concerning Timothy, like a child serving his father, he served me. Other version says he served with me. He served me, but he also served with me. Joseph stands alongside his father, Jacob, and sonship of the entirety of the sons of Israel are accorded not just to Jacob, but both Jacob and, and Joseph. Ephraim, you know the writings of Jeremiah, all the other prophets, whenever you see an Ephraim, Ephraim is used as a pin code to describe the entirety of the nation. Right? I'm telling you, brethren, what you're willing to give up will never leave your life. I always say, money might leave my pocket or my bank account, but grace will never leave my life. What I need is the grace of, what I need is the grace of, of God. Amen. Just as we were talking uh, two days ago, we got an SMS while being here. And someone put 100,000 rand into our church bank account from a business in northern Mozambique. I'm telling you, tell someone this thing works. We emptied to support the vision of a father. God said, and the person specifically stated, I'm sowing this so that one day you will buy your own building. Yeah? I want to encourage you, there's nothing that God will not withhold from you when you're willing to come into a place of strong support. Just stand, let's just stand before we proceed. We may not even have the, the practical session because of time. Maybe we shouldn't. Let's just be sensitive. Sensitive to what the Lord is doing, okay? Amen. I want you to lift up your hands to the Lord. Come on, just lift up your hands to Him. For many of you, your presence here is a defining moment. Is a defining moment. Without Mordecai's guidance, Esther would not have fulfilled destiny as a son to Mordecai. And so, preserve the purposes of God afoot in her generation. She did not live in a realm called cursed. But she said in her own words, I will go to the king and if I perish, I perish. That is equivalent to Jesus being obedient unto the death of the cross. Obedience unto death. We empty ourselves of ourselves. Say, God, whatever it takes, I'm willing to go through to the, with this process of self-emptying. I want to die to myself. I don't want to live life and let it be said of me, they lived X number of years on the planet but contributed nothing to my purposes. So today, Father, we lift up holy hands without wrath or doubt. We come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in times of our need. We confess that we need you now more than ever before. And Father, we lift up these hands in absolute resolve. We resolve this day. We commit this day. We make a new commitment. Your purpose will be our priority. We exist for you. Our food is to do your will. And to finish the mandate. Father, that's why we are here. Let thy will be done. May we live seeing enactments of your purposes playing themselves out. 
within the context of our lives. And God, I know that you've given your, your purpose into the hands of fathers to steward and to administrate and to, and to manage. And you call us as sons to give strong support, not to men, but to your purpose in men. I ask in Jesus' name for grace now to be imparted, understanding, for eyes to be opened, for feet to start walking in obedient directions. I pray those of us who empty of ourselves, of any pride, self-ambition, I ask, oh God, that you would assist us in this process. We want to become bond servants of the Lord, willing slaves. Today we pierce our own ear. And we bind our ear to the door. We bind our, our, our hearing to, even now, Father, we close off any distracting voice, any contrary voice that seeks any bird of the air that seeks to steal this word. We forbid you in the name of the Lord. And Father, I pray, O oh God, let he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, O oh God, May this island produce sons that provide strong support to fatherly leaders. I ask, oh God, that purpose in this nation will thrive, that your will be done, that your kingdom come. There will be an army raised here like the army of David, comparable to the armies of heaven, I pray. I ask, oh God, your grace attend us all. I pray great grace. Great peace, mercy from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon us all, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. 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 God richly bless you. Amen.